Hello, friends. Why did the computer crash? Because it had a bad driver. Um, so this next, uh, this next, uh, please laugh. That was so funny. Um, so this, so this next session is going to be broken up into two separate parts, both inv involving artificial intelligence. And the first is going to require you to imagine a future where both attackers and defenders are using faster uh, pattern matching and increased computational speed in order to achieve their goals. So here to talk about that and the applications of, for the technology across both fraud and security are Clay Wilkes, the founder and CEO of Galileo Processing. Come up, Clay. <laughs> and Pedro Domingos, uh, Dominguez, uh, a professor at the University of Washington and author of The Master Algorithm. Please clap for them. Now will be the time. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. <coughs> and I have not coughed for a month. And just as I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm getting ready for this session and cough kicks up. So I apologize for that. Um, it's my high honor, great privilege to uh, introduce uh, Pedro Dominguez, who um, has been, was described to me earlier today as the shack, if you, if you will. He's actually the opposite of shack, if you see him standing, um, of, uh, of uh, AI and machine learning. It's, it's um, it's a particular individual privilege because <clears throat> um, one of the first books that, um, that I was really enamored with was his book, um, which is um, uh, The uh, Master Algorithm. And uh, welcome. It's nice to, Thank nice you. to have you here. It's good to be here. Thanks for coming, people. And I am uh, Clay Wilkes, CEO of Galileo. And um, what we want to do is talk a little bit about um, AI and machine learning. <coughs> and. Um, in general, and then relate that to financial services and, and maybe what you should be thinking about in terms of, uh, of, of your own uh, programs and, and uh, capabilities. So um, Sean gave a great introduction and uh, talked about imagining a future. How do you see the future? Well, I think, you know, he said imagine a future <coughs> where both attackers and defenders are using AI. I think that future is now. Attackers and defenders are both already using AI. And uh, you know, maybe everybody's not as aware of that as they should be. Fraud and, and cybersecurity are an arms race, and that arms race started with just people on both sides. And then it moved on to you know, things that were just written code. Now that'd be like rules for catching you know, instances of fraud or, or spam or intrusions. And then the, you know, the attackers would also write code you know, that kept always varying. Uh, we're actually now at a different stage where you know, both sides are using machine learning. And, and, and in fact, if, if you try to fight machine learning with code, you are doomed. Because the machine learning evolves faster than anybody writing code ever can do. And, and of course, you know, like the bad guys are just as interested in AI and just as, you know, keeping track of what's developing and, and what they can use as, as everybody else. So I think everybody needs to be aware of that. You know, Pedro, one of the things in your book that I was uh, intrigued with was, was this hypothetical and the way you sort of laid it out, which is this uh, sort of military exercise. Um, can you just share that just briefly without going into a lot of detail? What is that? And then I'll ask you a follow-up question as it relates to um, what, how it might apply to financial services. Uh, you mean the city with the robots? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so um, I, I was at, you know, so DARPA, right, is the biggest funder of AI research uh, in the world, probably, at least historically. And every now and then they have one of these workshops to decide, you know, what the next big push in AI should be. And I was at one of these workshops and I kind of like half jokingly mentioned this scenario of maybe what we can do is have, you know, a little bit like the movie Escape from New York, have a walled off city where robots are allowed to roam inside and they can, you know, kill and destroy each other all they want. And then every generation, the winning robots said in the middle of the city, there's a big, you know, 3D printing facility and the winning robots get to program the next generation of robots. So that way you evolve better and better soldiers. So, you know, I, I mentioned this as kind of like a, a thought exercise, and one of the military brass there said very matter-of-factly, yeah, that's feasible. And, and if you think about it, like, you know, there are these, like, you know, mock Iraqi villages and Afghan villages in the California desert, so they can train, so maybe this is not that big of a, of a leap. You know, one of the things that uh, Bill Gates, who's actually the individual that, uh, whose uh, book list that I noticed uh, Pedro's book on, and the premier of China share, which is, uh, they both think extremely highly of, uh, of the research, the work, and the, the way that um, it's described in the book, um, um, uh, The Master Algorithm, which we're giving away 100 signed copies 
uh, immediately after the session, actually at three o'clock, I believe, three o'clock um, at our at our uh, um, uh, booth, which is not not our booth. It's actually in the hall. It's uh, 2401B uh, is the. So if you want a uh, signed copy of Pedro's book, please come. Um, <clears throat> What do you see as a, as a threat to financial services? What, um, kind of describe that in terms of AI. What do you think is out there in the future? Well, there's a, there's a whole uh, you know, panoply of threats, of course. But I think one of, the, one of the biggest ones is that the finance system depends on people's confidence to work, right? So if people lose confidence in the system, then nothing works anymore. And, and if a system is pervaded with intrusions and security problems, then people lose their trust in the system. So in some ways, the bigger cost of, of, of an intrusion or security problem that goes undetected until too late is not necessarily even the immediate cost, even though that cost is very high. It's just the loss of confidence that people get in the system from that. And this, if this happens over you know, and over again, doesn't even have to be at the same firm, then, you know, then, then I think the, the, the cost of that could be really large and, and, and systemic. Um, can I get uh, the, the show to activate uh, polling question number one? <clears throat> so we have a polling question for you to consider, which is, do you think your company is prepared to combat cyber, cyber security threats today? And uh, this is uh, for you to participate in. If you think so, um, please indicate it if you would. Um, it's interesting to watch um, AI, its, its role, the way we've at least understood it at Galileo, and we've had a very successful uh, endeavor um, uh, uh, in the area of fraud and significant research in the area of information security, which is what we're discussing today. But in the area of fraud, uh, fraud is one of those things that um, you really truly begin to worry about as your program begins to scale and gets significant scale because it's a number one uh, uh, indicator of whether or not you're going to have a profitable program. There are so many things related to the fraud activity. And in, in the um, financial systems uh, eco ecosystem today, um, what we see is um, a majority of, uh, of entities actually using a product <clears throat> that you know, can achieve a, uh, as, as you're me measuring these AIs, um, can, can uh, achieve a, um, a precision of around 0.25. Um, and Galileo is achieving a, a precision of around 0.90. So extraordinary differences. Um, and, um, and the question is, is you know, what, what's coming? Um, and are we prepared, not just as Galileo prepared, but are we as an industry prepared uh, for the threat that, um, that is clearly, uh, you don't need to imagine much in terms of AI to, to realize that it can be used for both good and bad. Uh, and what we're seeing at Galileo <clears throat> on the information security side now, rather than fraud, is we're seeing a clear escalation. So we're seeing things like, you know, going from a few thousand threats a day to or, uh, now over a few uh, million threats actually an hour. Uh, and so, and, and I don't know that AI is fully engaged, so where does that go? Where does it lead? What are your thoughts, Pedro? Where does, uh, where does it go in terms of... Uh, uh, of the threat for the financial system and, um, and how do we defend against it? Well, I think like every arms race, uh, it doesn't stay still. And this actually makes, makes things like you know, fraud and cybersecurity different from a lot of the more standard machine learning applications where you're modeling a static world if you're doing, say, image recognition or, or translation and so forth. Things don't change in response to what you do. But when you're dealing with an adversary as you're dealing, as, as is the case in, in, in these problems, you could actually have a machine learning solution that works really well today against the threats of the past and the present, but then you know, they, they're not gonna sit still. They're gonna figure out ways to defeat it. And so you, could, you, know, you, you have to be constantly alert because suddenly you know, the accuracy of your detection could start to go way down and you need to quickly figure out you know, what is happening and, and now develop better algorithms to beat whatever it is that they're doing now. And then they will do the same thing in turn. So this is something that requires your constant attention, and it requires a mix of the human and the machine, right? Many machine learning applications, once you deploy them, you know, they will stay stable for a long time. But in this case, you, you have to be constantly looking over the shoulder of, of, the, of the algorithms, if you will, to see what is going wrong and to figure out what are the new kinds of things that you can do. And then, you know, like the, of course, the data is a huge multiplier. So you can do a lot more if what you're doing is directing the machine learning than if you're trying to you know, fight these attacks uh, one at a time. 
Um, one of the things, I had an opportunity to have dinner uh, with Pedro last night, and one of the things we talked about was um, some of the work that you've done and local minima. So right. do you want to describe sort of how that, um, how that plays out and, and what some of the work you're doing now and uh, um, uh, what the relationships are and how you need to try and establish those? Yeah, well, you know, the, 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 the problem in machine learning is that usually the functions that we're trying to optimize are, are you know, they have a lot of local optima, and it's easy to get trapped in one that is not very good. This is really, you know, the, the bend of machine learning. Uh, if, you, if you could somehow, you know, find your global optima more easily, then you can actually do much better. Uh, and now how you do that is actually where a lot of, you know, your creativity comes in, also where a lot of your knowledge of the problem comes in, right? Because if you just, computers are very good at doing very large amounts of search, but if you just do the search blindly, they probably will get tracked in a local optima, or worse, they will overfit. So how does that relate to um, all of our environments? Um, you know, we have no network environments, server environments, application environments, and these relationships that seemingly don't mean much um, could end up being related. Yeah, so um, this is I th actually think one of the, if you look at what people are doing now, these things for the most part are local optima, meaning you could do a lot better. Right? If you actually do it better, suddenly you know, your, your accuracy can, can, can really jump. And you know, one small example of this, well, or maybe not so small, is, is this fact that there are you know, many things that, for example, individually do not look suspicious, so you wouldn't flag them, uh, but collectively they look very suspicious. But in order to do that, you have to be able to connect the dots. You have to be able to establish the relationship between them. So you know, like a traditional example of this is from counterterrorism. If somebody goes and shoots a video of New York City Hall, well, they're probably just a tourist, right? You're not gonna arrest them because of that. If, if somebody goes and bu buys a bunch of ammonia, right, they're probably just a farmer, right? They, you know, they're buying the ammonia you know, to make fertilizer or, or whatever, right? But if the, if the guy who bought the ammonia and the guy who shot a video of City Hall have been in phone communication, now those two things together actually start to look a little bit suspicious. And That's if there's enough for those, right? yeah, exactly. And if there's enough of those, so that what's the conclusion? I mean, you, you want to consider more weight, right? Yeah, so if there's enough of, so notice first of all, that in order to detect this, you actually need to be able to detect the individual behaviors, which is what a lot of machine learning already does today. But you also need to detect the connection. For example, the fact that these people, you know, were on a phone call together. And if you get enough of these, then you have a pattern that is not necessarily a sure indicator of, you know, terrorism or fraud or whatever, but it makes it probable enough that now it actually makes sense to dig deeper typically using a combination of humans and algorithms. But if you can get it to the point where, you know, where the false positive rate is sufficiently low, then, then at that point you can actually use people productively to go the rest of the way. Whereas before they would be lost in, in, in a sea of things. So it actually takes this combination of machine learning and, and, and humans you know, most of the time to, to do really well. One of the things we talked about at dinner last night was the, uh, the notion or idea of how quantum um, you know, computing plays into the future of AI. What, and you, you, you gave an initial thought uh, on encryption. What, uh, what is your thought there? Well, so obviously, uh, if quantum computing uh, is possible, right, then right now most, most, most research on quantum computing is theoretical. It's people doing mathematics, you know, saying like, oh, here's the equations of quantum mechanics, and can I, you know, create an algorithm to do whatever uh, uh, using that? So very nice exercise, but at the end of the day, you need real quantum computers. And so far, they have very few, bit, very few qubits because it's very hard to make more qubits and make them stable. But if you can make a quantum computer with enough qubits, then you can break all the encryption that today's internet is based on. Right? The encryption that is used today is based on the idea that it's very hard to factor numbers. Uh, well, uh, you know, it takes exponential work on a regular computer, on a classical computer. But on a quantum computer, you, you can factor, the, the algorithm for that already exists, right? It's just a question of it being implementable. You, you can break the encryption, you know, you can break everything, credit card numbers, that, whatever, right? That people send, you know, over the internet, so. It, it creates yeah. a uh, more dangerous world, right? If that it, theoretical realization happens. It creates a vastly more <laughs> dangerous world. And in fact, if somebody today was, was able to make a quantum computer with enough bits, we would be completely unprepared. For, you know, like they would, they would have an extraordinary amount of power. If they were a state actor, they could actually spy on, on everybody else to their heart's content. If they were someone who, you know, was intent on committing crime, they would have, you know, an enormous leeway to do that. 
Uh, one of the more um, maybe uh, famous or notable examples of AI as a threat to the financial system potentially is, uh, is this uh, deep locker, right, malware that came out uh, maybe six months ago. Um, and the ability to be able to adapt and, and uh, hide itself and all the rest of it that comes with it. Um, and then, um, you know, in the last Black Hat, some uh, conversations around um, defending AI with AI and the concerns that, that that might raise or give rise to. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, here's an analogy, right? Um, bank robbers use cars to get away after bank robbers, right? So, you know, cars were a great thing, but they also had this negative effect that now the bank robbers could get away a lot faster, right? Now, the solution to that is not to shut down the highway system or to, or to you know, uh, um, outlaw cars, right? The solution to that is to give the cops faster cars than the, you know, than the robbers have. And I think it's the same thing with AI. It is inevitable that the bad guys are going to use AI. What we need to make sure is that we have more powerful AI on the side of catching them. And then they will catch them the same, it's like, you know, William Turing, uh, sorry, uh, uh, William Gibson had this in, in Neuromancer, right? He had this concept of the Turing police. The Turing police was an AI, pol was, it was AI police, right? So the bad guy in Neuromancer is this big AI that wants to take over the world. But then there was the Turing police, which is AI, whose job is to catch bad AIs. And actually, this is not science fiction today. If you look at what you know, the FBI is doing and, you know, and the SEC in some respects, this is what they're doing. Is they're using AI to catch you know, the schemes, you know, whether or not they've been produced by AI, that the bad guys are coming up with. Can you share with us what a, what a GAN is and how that works and how that relates to what you just said? Yeah, so a GAN is, GAN is short for Generative <laughs> Adversarial Network. And it's one of the hottest topics in machine learning right now. It's a type of deep learning, so it's a type of you know, a neural network, if you will. But it's one that's very trained in a very different way from the usual. Usually we have the subjective function, some form of accuracy and simplicity, and we optimize it, often winding up in a local optimum. But that it tends to be limited in what it can produce. GANs are a really fascinating idea because in a GAN, the arms race that we've been talking about is inside the algorithm. A GAN is actually two networks, one of which is trying to generate fake data that looks as much as possible like the real data, and the other one is just trying to decide whether, for example, an image that it's seeing is real or fake. And, and the fact that they are competing against each other forces both of them to get very good. So at the end of the day, you can generate by this process images and videos and you know, audio that are much more realistic than anything that went before. In fact, these days with GANs, you can you know, pretty much generate any evidence of anything that you want, right? If you hate someone and want them to, you know, to be caught saying that they're gonna, I don't know, assassinate someone, you can actually produce a video saying that. So this is another yeah, aspect yeah, where things are becoming very, you know. It's a very strange future, potentially, right, to contemplate. Yeah. Yeah, again, the, to, to, to Pedro's example, again, that uh, I had a little experience with this, the famous one around the movie stars, right? And initially, the one produces a blob, and the, uh, the other is able to discriminate, and, and eventually, you can't actually tell, the human can't tell. Yeah. It's, it's actually pretty uh, scary to, to think about that. Um, uh, one of the things that, you know, Galileo, we've, in, we, we've issued about 85 million accounts, um, and we're doing currently about 1.5 billion events every day. And as I think about that, um, the, I mean, do you ignore, right? Do you just assume that there are no threats in that data? Uh, or do you begin to look? And if you do look, how do you look? You know, is an InfoSec team capable of looking at that size of, uh, of threat? A potential threat, and um, and if it is human, I mean, what do you, what tools are you using, um, and and so this this gives rise to this notion or idea that we're talking about today. So, um, uh, um, what what do you, uh, what would you recommend? I mean, how how would you go about it if you're a, a financial system, a payments network, a startup in fintech? Uh, what what would you, uh, what would you, what would you suggest as a way, to, a practical way to approach the problem? Well, there's a number of ways, and I think you, always the first thing, if you haven't done that already, is to deploy, you know, the existing machine learning. And machine learning for things like, you know, fraud and cybersecurity, uh, the things that work well there tend to be different from the things that work well in other applications. You certainly want to start by doing that. Often there are things that you can do that will get you a long way, you know, without going any farther than that. But then after that, you need to start playing this game that realizing, like, if you put this in place, 
you know, the attackers will immediately look for ways to defeat it. So one thing to do, and in fact, you know, the, the, you know, the Pentagon and so on do this all the time, is to have a red team and a blue team. You, you want to have a set of people whose job it is to break your system. You know, they may be in-house, you know, often that's what companies prefer. Or you could just say, you know, like I will give a price to anyone who breaks my system. That is often a really good way to find the weaknesses in what you're doing. And then you, you know, build defenses against those and, and, and so on. Thank you. Come get a, uh, a copy of the book, The Master Algorithm, and uh, learn a little bit, little bit more about the topic today. Thanks for your time so much. Thank, Thank you. you. That was great. Thanks so much, guys. Really yeah. appreciate it. Great Thank job. You. Great Thank job. You. So from practical re re uh, recommendations to practical obstacles, this next half of the session is going to really focus on the hurdles that payments companies and banks and financial institutions broadly have to jump to in order to kind of perform better pattern matching and higher levels of computation. So with me to discuss that is Michael Reitblatt. You're the CEO and co-founder of Forder. Please, uh, Michael's a little shy, please clap for him. <laughs> it's a really strong hairline. You look great, Mike. So listen, um, I often get really frustrated about conversations about artificial intelligence because to me, it's, it's mostly a marketing term. Um, uh, 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 you know, used by, by startups to kind of raise more funding. Um, can we just level set and talk about pragmatically where the, where the technology is today? So I think in almost all cases, maybe even all cases today, when people talk about AI, they don't really mean AI. They mean a specific use of machine learning. Mm -hmm. Most of that, at least from what I've seen, is not even that. It's a basic decision tree, and it's basically code for automation. So if you have a machine that does something multiple times, you call it AI because it's catchy. Yeah. Uh, I kind of remember the phrase that people used to say that the most intelligent thing about IBM Watson is their marketing department. Uh, I, shout, shout out IBM. I think they got a little better since, but the, the, the abuse of the term AI, right, the conversation about AI is from the 40s or the 50s, yeah. and we're abusing that term so heavily that people don't really understand I, what I it means. I think when most people think about artificial intelligence, what they're really thinking about is um, uh, kind of mimicking human understanding, mimicking human intelligence, right? right? Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're not... Uh, and, and where the technology is today, it's, it's not making judgments, right? It's, it's just ultimately just processing information really, really fast. Yep. I think, I'll give you a, a, an example. I think we, you and I talked about this before. In the early, no, mid-80s, my father actually used to work on one of the first chess software with Mikhail Butwinik, who used to be the world chess champion. Yeah. And they were working a lot, of, like, think 80s, right? Massive machines, a lot of budget. And I was a uh, six-year-old, and I would beat this thing every time. It was yeah. not even funny. And today, my phone, a free app with it, will beat the world champion in a one-on-one, -on -one, in a simultaneous game against all chess players. It doesn't, it's, it's not fun the other way around now. But it's not that my phone or the app there understands chess the way humans understand it. It just can calculate millions or tens of millions of moves and positions every second, so it can get to a better result without actually understanding why it does what it does. So, so from that impractical example, right, what, what, are, what are practical applications of the technology broadly? How is this technology being used effectively really broadly mm -hmm. within financial services, outside of financial services? So I think uh, there, when, we, when we look at machine learning, what it, it really enables you to do is first find patterns in massive amounts of data that humans just can't analyze. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second thing it enables you to do, and actually I'm really happy that uh, Pedro brought it up before that, is GANs, right? The ability to have multiple algorithms that are fighting each other. You don't really understand what makes it better, mm -hmm. right? If you're moving from chess to Go, right? Yes. AlphaGo or AlphaGo Zero, Google's Correct. algorithm that can beat everyone in Go now, including all the other softwares, taught itself by playing against itself <laughs> yeah. multiple times and constantly upgrading uh, its own system. And it enables the algorithms to becoming smarter at whatever the task you want them to do. Unlike AI, which the original thought was it'll be a machine that understands humans or thinks like humans. No, it's just an algorithm that is very, very good at a specific, especially if you can well define it, uh, task. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so back to my original question. Mm -hmm. how, how, is that, how is that pattern matching technology being used today effectively? So one of the 
probably uh, best use cases is in image recognition. Right? Uh -huh. Software today is able to detect specific items way better than humans. Right, the famous cats and dogs example. Yes. Right, you feed, you take a sophisticated algorithm, you feed it with a billion, do uh, sorry, a billion uh, pictures of cats, a billion pictures of dogs. It'll be better than any human in detecting ca whether it's a cat or a dog in a picture. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there are really good use cases of translation. Right, a lot of not very not translating Tolstoy probably, mm -hmm. but if you want to translate the m content or the kind of basic meaning. A computer will be able to do it very, very effectively across multiple languages just because it analyzed billions of texts and it knows how uh, specific sentences so, are. So focusing in on financial stuff. services, right. you know, what, 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 what are those pragmatic applications? So fraud detection uh, is something that leveraged a lot from machine learning in general. Yes. N but too often I think people refer to AI or machine learning as this magic solution. We'll deploy AI within our system and then we will have no fraud because we're smarter than what the fraudsters can do. So first we heard that fraudsters use AI actually, well, machine learning, way better than us or at least most of, uh, most of the financial institutions. And second, AI has a fallacy problem that it, uh, it's only as good as the data we feed into it and it's only as good as how we almost think of it teach it. Right, you show, unlike cats and dogs, which is very, very well defined, right? You can show it, this is a billion cats, go look for cats. Mm -hmm. You can say, here's a billion uh, fraudulent transactions, first, because none of us wants to collect a billion fraudulent transactions, and second, because they're all very, very different. Sure. It's like saying, here is a bunch of pictures, detect cats in it. It, it wouldn't know what to do. Sure. So, so I want to go to Slido, and, and by the way, I, I, uh, I should have said something earlier. Please start submitting questions over Slido. This is only useful if it's useful to you. Um, so, so please make sure to feed us questions. You know, what type of IT infrastructure does an institution need to implement these AI tools to better prevent fraud? Uh, so I'm not an IT infrastructure person, but <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll abstract outside of that. <laughs> no, right? no, no. Like, so yeah. I think what you need, you, you need two things. You need to, a way to collect uh, data properly. You need a way in a process, which is more, less of an IT. It's actually a, uh, probably a human process. How do you clean the data and actually you know what's coming in, right? Sure. Garbage in, garbage out. If you, yes. if you won't control the information that's coming in, you won't get anything out of it, no matter how sophisticated the algorithm is. The third thing, especially in financial sectors, you need to be able to process all of that in sub-seconds, maybe mm -hmm. sub-100 milliseconds, in some cases in sub-10 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. right? You really need extremely flexible and uh, high frequency calculations. I want to go back to this, this question about good, good fraud problems and uh, mm -hmm. that, that, AI, that AI is, uh, is mm -hmm. really useful for. I mean, what is AI not effective in terms of fraud management? How is AI not effective? Like what problems are not, are, can't effectively be solved by deep machine learning? Right, deep machine learning is two different things. Yes, go ahead, yes, I'm so sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> But See, I, even I don't understand what the standard definition is. Uh, I'm pretty Thank sure. Thank you for laughing. By, I know by a vote, like very few people understand what deep learning actually is. Exactly. Well, yes. Uh, and the in in fraud, right? We, we we said that you you need to feed it enough data for it to be able to recognize it. Correct. There was a kind of a famous, or not so famous, but there's a there are a bunch of grad students out of Stanford use the same algorithm that did for that Google uses for image recognition. And it didn't work. It would recognize cats as everything was enough green in it. Or sorry, it would recognize dogs as everything was enough green in it mm -hmm. because they only f used 10,000 pictures for each and dogs play outside so the machine decided that everywhere, that whatever there was classified as a dog, there was a lot of grass in it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Must, green must be dogs. Sure. Right? If you take a child and you show it one cat and one dog, it'll probably be able to detect cats and dogs forever. Yes. Right? Very, very different capability and I actually, in fraud, we can't have a billion fraud cases. And even if we can have, let's say, 10 million fraud cases, mm -hmm. when you compare that, uh, wire fraud or credit card fraud is very different. Like, once you start breaking it into all the different fraud cases, especially since you look at it from an individual financial institution perspective, you may, have, you may find yourself with, I don't know, 10,000 examples of each, mm -hmm. best case scenario, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's literally useless, especially for deep learning. Yes, for sure. So, so I, uh, back to Slido, uh, can you mm -hmm. share a really specific example of what a large bank is doing with artificial intelligence to, to, to prevent fraud? 
large bank is doing. Doing, correct. Uh, so I think one useful thing that AI oh, machine learning is And if you can name that bank that would be great too. So we don't work with banks that often and the few examples that I do know I don't want to like I can't, God, yeah, I can't disclose bless. the names. I'm so sorry. But, uh, but again thank you for laughing I know I'm funny. Ha having said the same thing I'm not sure the banks especially from my experience are at the level where they're using in production that they're using machine learning uh, effectively. In the lab they're doing a lot of cool stuff mm -hmm. but in productions first considering like there was a question about IT infrastructure. Yeah. Very difficult to run AI on mainframes. <laughs> uh, very difficult to deploy changes to AI uh, when right there is a once every six months you can you can make an upgrade because it's a live banking system you can't it, you can't take it down so a lot of it is trying to um, you try to obfuscate it you're trying to pull data somewhere else and analyze it then come back to it later there's a lot uh, IT like the infrastructure of a lot of financial institutions because it's so hard for them to change it. Mm -hmm. We're working with some banks and they're doing the process, right? They're actually investing a lot of it. It's a monstrous effort to take the l extremely well working financial infrastructure, banking infrastructure, and update it to the one that you can actually apply AI to. But coming back to, to the original questions, mimicking, or sorry, not mimicking, uh, identifying whether this transaction is fraudulent or not is extremely hard because you don't have enough data. And taking one step backward and saying, well, let's look at transactions that were originated from a different location. It may violate my policy. I don't know if it's fraud or not yet. Sure. But you have more transactions that are similar to that, and it's easier. They're not, usually they're not as sophisticated in how they hide. So, right? so you, can, you can start modeling sub questions out of this is it fraud or not. So, so let's, let's double down on this, mm -hmm. on this issue of obstacles, right? Yep. Like wh what are, wh what's the real large hurdle here to, to actually get better machine learning and pattern matching in production inside of payments companies, inside of financial technology companies? So, right, I think there are three challenges. The first one is the IT one that we talked about and it will be solved. I think most banks, at least the large ones, are making the headways to update their infrastructure to actually be able to support it. And we, on, we focus on banks a lot here, but it's not just the banks, right? It's different type of payment companies and it's the retailers themselves mm -hmm. and a lot of other service companies or fintech companies, which is actually part of their advantage is they don't need to update the infrastructure. They just sure, upload whatever sure. Amazon gives them and uh, kind of they're ready to go. The second issue is the scale of data, right? If we aggregate the whole market, maybe we can find, let's say, 100 million uh, bad cases. So you mm -hmm. can actually start modeling. Sure. If you're, you keep fragmenting and every bank will try to build its own solution and every company will try to build its own solution, they'll never reach critical mass of data. And the third thing that we talked about is fraud is an ever-changing problem. And I think by focusing on can we detect fraud, we end up being in can we generate enough false positives. Mm. Everything that looks suspicious, we'll throw a flag, we'll move it to people because all of a sudden AI is not, well, machine learning is not sophisticated enough. Sure. And we, ha we need people. And so, it's a, so, so it's about prioritizing, prioritizing alerts, right? No, it's, it's, I actually think the approach here is entirely wrong. By focusing on can we detect fraud, you're trying to detect the hardest thing possible. Because fraud, the fraudsters yeah. are super sophisticated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of them, and this is why I'm not sure we're going to win this battle that easy in terms of we'll have better AI. A lot of the fraud is state sponsored. Yeah. Which means, or at the very least, state sure, overlooked. Sure. Well, yeah, well, just uh, without going down that rabbit hole. Uh, and, uh, right, they're, they're having a lot of sophisticated uh, infrastructure as well. If we focus on how can we leverage machine learning to c clearly and confidently identify the good transactions and only so focusing on people you can actually match, you can talk to them, you can yes. test it, uh, and they're easier to detect and only leave yourself with the ones that you're sure are not falling into the first category, right? So okay. if you can so find 99.5% of people and say, okay, you're all good. Now yes. let's double down and, and, and zoom in on the bad ones and use machine learning to identify good behavior versus identify bad behavior, you'll end up with a better result. So, so I want to I, I, I wanna like triple and underline mm -hmm. that thing that you said about information sharing because mm -hmm. it's really the scale of data that keeps mm -hmm. Us from kind of getting to better models. I mean, what are the hurdles to better information sharing? <laughs> and I mean, there are a lot, right? Because there are incentives. We had a panel earlier where a lot of information security folks are really uh, are really interested in sharing information back and forth mm -hmm. um, through through FSI SAC or FSR, mm -hmm. right? I mean, does does that do, do those incentives do, do they do they exist similarly inside of fraud management? So I think 
you have two or three main problems, right? You have a, a privacy and so let's call it regulation problem, privacy, Correct. security, yeah, sure. and so on. Sure, sure, I actually sure. think it's solvable even under the new kind of GDPR, post GDPR uh, yeah, regime. Yeah. But uh, the, the two other issues is uh, first one is lining up the incentives. Different people, even if they want to share data, they want to get something else out of it. And, uh, but the second and probably the biggest issue is a lot of the companies that you want sharing data are competing and they can't give you access to that data. Right? Mm -hmm. If you take two banks, if they'll share their transaction data without anonymizing it, so actually in making it useless, or sure. almost useless, it means your competitor will look at the data and say, oh, these are your customers, these is, this is the transactions that they're doing, I need to go target these customers. Sure. So I haven't seen two banks that are, or two retailers for that matter, that are willingly willing to kind of to share that data. There were multiple initiatives and it always came down to you share first or I'll anonymize everything and send you aggregated reports, which you can't work on because you actually need to get to the, uh, to the individual transaction or personal level, which calls for two types of collaborations. The first one is decentralized and blockchain is used a lot in it. Oh, you had to say blockchain and artificial I, no, no, intelligence. No, but only in a negative sense. Yeah. Uh, so I actually, I don't believe that it's possible for the payment or uh, the financial sector because current, the current implementation of blockchain, maybe some, I'll, I'll find sure. something new, is gets worse the bigger it is. Mm -hmm. right? So if everyone will use it properly, it, it will be so clogged. Uh, it, there are a lot of really great implementations of blockchain for specific use cases. I don't think it's a, it's a good one here. And the other one is have a, you have a centralized company that's not competing with anyone, gets data from everyone, can analyze it, and sends back the results rather than the data. So, so uh, listen, I, we only have a few minutes left. I really mm -hmm. want to get to these Slido questions. Are U.S. regulators sufficiently and actively supporting use of AI for fraud detection, prevention, and investigation? Or are the regulators a barrier to progress? I'm going to work with Visa here. Do you really want me to say something about the U.S. regulators? I, I mean, listen, <laughs> we already threw IBM under the bus. I don't think they can evoke me. Uh, but, God bless. <laughs> uh, look, I think the main major issue with U.S. regulation or any regulation for that mm -hmm. matter, it always lags a step behind. It mm -hmm. sees, oh, there's innovation happening over here. First, let's see what it is. Second, sure. let's try it's to reaction. evaluate whether it's good or bad. And it's too late. And oftentimes, it's overreacting to the phenomena itself. Right? GDPR has a lot of great stuff. It has a lot of negative issues. Uh, and I think the California law is actually taking GDPR one step to the worst side of it. Well, I mean, surely those, uh, without getting into a conversation, I, those regulations are, are very aspirational. But so a, another question, mm -hmm. how do you make sure your machine learning algorithms stay current against fraud? Um, uh, maybe a mention of a, an, an mm -hmm. automation framework that you would recommend. Well, the first thing we, we, is, I, I actually don't make, and we, we sort of touched about this. AI refers to, uh, Right? Can we can have trained machines to think like humans? Correct. I think we're too far away from that. But another term from the 50s is actually IA. There was a big debate whether which one of the two streams will go there. And IA is intelligence augmentations. Is how can we use technology and automation and machine learning uh, to make humans more effective, right? So, and leverage uh, the research teams that you have and leveraging the decision-making uh, teams that you have to be substantially more effective. So there's no one framework that fits all. You need to really understand your problem. You really need to understand uh, how can your team solve s the specific challenge that you have. There's no, here is AI in a box for, uh, for fraud prevention for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very, very different algorithms that are super effective in specific use cases and completely useless in others, right? Predicting the weather and detecting fraud if you'd use the same algorithm, you'll, you won't do any, any of them good. Okay. I think this works as a really gre uh, great last question. It's from mm -hmm. our friend Mike. Shout out, Mike. Uh, what practical steps should banks take to put theory into action? To put what? Theory into action. <sighs> Besides work with Forder. No, so I'm, 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 even b before we get there, it's m my kind of short experience working with banks. There's a huge disconnect between the innovation labs that will test anything in a very limited fashion. They'll put a lot of money in it, they'll put yes. a lot of really talented people in it. But the moment you try to connect what's very successful there to the core system, you, get, you can't even get through the door. 
Mm -hmm. The best case, you'll say, yeah, yeah, the 2027, I don't know, whatever. Sure. We're not, we can't do it for a million reasons. I think because of regulation, banks became kind of a regulation and compliance companies rather than of a course. technology companies. And they're pushing everything out. If the banks need, and I don't know how to advise them to do it better, but if the banks will find a way to test technology on the real, leveraging the real data, and in their production actually looking at the, at the kind of impact there, they'll be able to get so much further than all the innovation labs in the world. So, so, so the talent is there. It's just, talent it's, is definitely it's, there. It's just, it's just relying on those innovation labs in a much broader way. No, then, no, 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 no. I say ahead. kill the innovation kill labs. Kill the innovation Kill lab. the innovation labs and bring technology. Use your core teams on your real data to, to, to try to find solutions that are actually actionable and not back to the, what the first question we started was great marketing stand. We tested this and it does something really cool, but we'll never use it because that's too yeah. risky. Yeah. So I think that's a great place to end. Friends, thank you so much for being with us. Um, uh, we're going to take about a five minute break and then mm -hmm. we're going to come back and, and kind of talk about um, uh, fraud inside of gaming. So thank you so much. I appreciate you.